Top of the morning, Dan and Amy uh, Alan Dershowitz uh, commenting on the uh, Alec Baldwin killing on his movie set. According to one film school expert who specializes in these matters, protocols had to have been broken in the instance because the film industry has very it has a very specific set of guidelines to prevent something like this from happening. The guidelines, seem, uh, Dershowitz writes, the guidelines seem not to have been followed in this case, and the existing guidelines seem insufficient to prevent accidents like this. He writes, it's therefore, it's likely, therefore, that the killing of Helena Hutchins could constitute a homicide, that is, a criminal killing. The remaining questions are who might be criminally responsible for the killing and what degree of homicide fits the evidence. And then he goes through it a little bit, including on Bald, with respect to Baldwin, which he suggests is unlikely that he would be charged criminally even per his role and responsibility as an executive producer on the film and that may very well be the case well uh, what about the there... executive director dave halls who yelled cold gun could he be charged with anything because a woman has come forward maggie goal she worked with him on a previous project and said that he failed to honor safety standards sort of dangerous work standards um pace too fast of pace, ignoring people when they say that they need a minute to do something safely. Because don't you think somebody's going to be charged in this? Well, we'll see. I, I don't know. Obviously, the, the, you, you, you uh, go up and down the responsibility chain for the handling of these weapons on set and uh, who followed the safety protocols and who did not, and then does the negligence of a particular individual rise to the level of criminality. That's the question, so we'll find out. Uh, we'll see how the investigation goes, I should say. That's that's effectively how we'll so find out. The Alec Baldwin thing is interesting, though. I mean, beyond criminality, it's interesting. Obviously, obviously there's likely to be a civil case, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and uh, those who have responsibility for the movie and the set and so forth, the, the producer level, certainly will be involved in a civil proceeding if there is to be a suit filed, even if they're not involved in a criminal one beyond the investigation. And the armor on set that day, she was 24 years old. Her name is Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. She'd only worked on one prior film. So this was her second film in her career. And she uh, talked about how insecure she was on a podcast for that first film. I was really nervous about it at first, and I almost didn't take the job because I wasn't sure if I was ready. Uh, it's just you know everything well, she's yeah, ever said. A, things come it, forward, but yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't implicate her in any way. We have no idea what she did or didn't do on the set, and we have no idea that references. I don't know if I'm ready to do my first film. That doesn't mean I'm ready to maintain uh, you know actor safety on set. I mean, you can't take comments out of context and start to assign criminal culpability. We don't know who did what yet, and so. Uh, other than starting, uh, you know, up the decision-making chain and going down, we just don't know. But, yeah, there are certainly questions about who knew what when. And this guy, Walls, was he uh, reckless or worse? How did, you know, I mean, it's, it's simple right. Well, she too. is the armor on set. She's the, she is the one. You know, yeah. with the chain of simple command, she was the one questions. who should have handled Alex Baldwin simple with a gun. Simple questions. Yeah. How did a live round get in the chamber? Why did no one check the gun, including Alec Baldwin? Yeah, that's right. He could have simple, checked it, too. Simple questions will yield, I think, a, a trove of information on this if you pursue simple questions to their, their truth. For more on uh, this and other matters, we're pleased to be joined again by our friend David Harsani, who is senior writer for National Review, and he's got a new book out as well. It's called Euro Trash, uh, Why America Must Reject the Failed Ideas of a Dying Continent. David, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, you wrote uh, a book uh, previously uh, about uh, America's enduring free, uh, uh, enduring relationship, enduring freedom, um, uh, with respect to Second Amendment rights from the beginning of our republic to present. Um, what, what's your handle on um, what transpired on that set and, and the coverage of it subsequently? Um, I mean, obviously, it's such a tragedy, and, it, and you just feel, you know, I'm no Alec Baldwin fan, but you, you, don't, you, know, you assume he obviously didn't do anything on purpose. Maybe he was negligent. I don't know is the answer. 
I mean, I think from what I've read that, you know, this is, it's kind of, it's even, it's partly his responsibility as well to make sure that the gun isn't loaded with live rounds and, um, it's just a tragedy, and I'm really sure. You know, guns are in toys, and not even when, when you're when you're playing with them in movies, and, and uh, people have to treat them with more respect. I think. Yeah, fair enough. And and I mean, you know, there's some piling on going on on Alec Baldwin, myself included, because you have so many people in that community I'm talking about Hollywood that are pro gun banning, and and then it turns out that you have all these professionals on set. And you have something like this occur. And by the way, it's not the first instance. Uh, this calls to mind Brandon Lee's killing on the set of The Crow. Um, and even, and Dershowitz brought this up, Vic Morrow, too. Um, uh, and I think it was his two children killed. Um, and, and there was actually a criminal prosecution in that case. So, you know, it's just the, the, the lecturing uh, America about things they know very little about. And then they turn around and are trying to play act with them and somebody dies. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I mean, Alec Baldwin has a big mouth, right? He said a lot of stupid things in the past, still, uh, you know, just, uh, just a tragic situation. I, I'm, I was slightly confused. I mean, my, my understanding was that you couldn't even really put a live round into a gun, meaning, you know, sometimes there's something in there, not, not a, a, you know, not a bullet, basically. I think that's how Brandon Lee died, something that was just a projectile in there of a different kind. So I, I don't know. It seems like we'll obviously we'll know more at some point. Right. Um, I wanted to get your reaction to, you know, Joe Biden, the fabulist. We've um, we talk a lot about, you know, Joe Biden misstating things, Joe Biden using come on, man, as an argument. But Joe Biden and his apocryphal stories, because there was uh, he brought up a, a favorite of his um, while he was in New Jersey. And this is how he racked up uh, one and a half million miles on Amtrak and this apocryphal he's not an apocryphal figure in the in the sense that he existed but he is in the sense that um it's not possible that joe biden ever met him this uh amtrak uh conductor who supposedly congratulated came up and congratulated joe biden upon his achieving 1.5 million miles of amtrak travel this guy named angelo negri who Joe called Angie, of course, because he's, you know, colloquial like that. He's got that common touch. And yet this this guy um, retired two decades, retired from Amtrak two decades before that meeting could have happened. And it's just, and it's, it's corn pop and it's just so much else. Joe Biden, the sort of the professional fairy tale teller and what that says about this president. I mean, he's been doing this forever, obviously. And what was it, 80, 88 election? He was caught basically, he, you know, talking about how he graduated law school in the top of his class, et cetera. <laughs> My favorite is when his dad sits him down to tell him something like, you know, transgenderism is not, there's nothing wrong with <laughs> yeah. transgenderism in like 1955. Um, or his dad, you know, he sees two men making out in Delaware in 1956 as a kid, and his dad tells him, love is love, or, you know. So those are my favorite. But, uh, I mean, he's done this forever. I just think he's not, you know, this isn't something new. It's not because he's older now. It's, you know, it's something he's done uh, forever. He makes up these stories. He makes up stories sometimes for political reasons in the sense of how he claimed to have marched in civil rights marches and and worked for the Black Panthers in in Newcastle or whatever it was in Delaware. And, you know, in the meantime, he was actually in the real real world at that time. He was friends with segregationists. They were his mentors and said it. So it's it's kind of nefarious in a way when you really think about some of these stories. But uh, I think it says a lot about him. I mean, he's he's he is willing to say anything to get ahead. And he's he's just a fabulous, not fabulous, but a fabulous. Do you think, I mean, he realizes what's going on in this country about with inflation. I mean, Janet Yellen said inflation's not going to you know, ease up until the end of 2022. Yeah. Uh, one thing about, about his lying, I just quickly want to say, yeah. I think he does believe a lot of these stories. It remi- I wrote about this once. It reminds me of uh, George Costanza in Seinfeld when he says it's not a lie if you believe it. He says it like he believes it, you know. Well, I think um, he's repeated the story so many times that he actually believes that it right. happened because that can happen right, too. exactly. Exactly. Uh, I don't know where his, what his state of mind is, you know, I mean, 
Inflation is something I think is, that is more dangerous for his presidency than anything else because yep. it's something tangible for most people. It's not some ideological argument. It's not a you know ten thousand miles away. It's at the grocery store, and it matters to a lot of people. So every time the administration dismisses it or he dismisses it, or he wants to spend more money to stop it, uh, I think that hurts his presidency, and I, I don't know what he's thinking. Uh, your book is uh, you know, admonishing America from uh, going the way of uh, the EU, uh, Euro trash, why America must reject the failed ideas of a dying continent. Um Boy, I, I don't know. We're pretty far down the road to turn back now, aren't we? Yeah, we're pretty far down the road. But I, you know, we can still slow things down. We can still stop things. I mean, you have this $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill. It's about um, expansion of the cradle to grave welfare system. It's about, you know, so those are things you can stop. I mean, there's still America is still a more dynamic place. The economic there's more of an entrepreneurial spirit here. These are things that matter, um, and I think that we, you know, just giving up is, is, is obviously not saying you are, but you know, you know, we go we're down the road. I think there's still things that can be done. Well, yeah. I mean, in point of fact, I mean, there's some things actually uh, in Europe that we could emulate, as, you know, from those Scandinavian countries that. Bernie Sanders likes to stylize as being these uh, socialist paradises. Actually, they've moved away from socialism some time ago, places like Sweden in so many respects, starting with school choice. So, I mean, there's things that um, we can point to and say, yeah, if you want to use these countries as an example, we can pick and choose the same way that you do. But let's pick and choose consistent with sort of founding principles. And I suppose that's the divide between, or should be at least, between conservatives and the left. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea that we could scale uh, the system that Denmark has here is, is ridiculous to begin with. But, but more than that, Bernie wants the rich to pay for everything. But that's not what they do in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia, you have a 65, 60 percent tax rate off the bat for the middle class, for everyone. Um, that I don't think the American, the American public would uh, accept such, such a rate or even anything close to it. And um, so it's, it's just a ridiculous thing. And moreover, as you mentioned, with school choice, Actually, Denmark and, and these places are quite capitalistic in other ways and ways that Bernie wouldn't like at all. So he has he has that whole equation wrong. How, how optimistic are you about um, the overreach on critical race theory curriculum and the treatment of parents who express concern or even anger in the direction of those who are perpetuating it? How optimistic are yeah. you that this development could really um, lead to a paradigm shift in K through 12 education here? Because it seems to me if we're not going to, if we're going to avoid uh, Europe's road to serfdom, as you write about, then you have to reimagine K through 12 education in in America. Right. I I don't know how consequential it will be in the long run, but I think it matters already in in some ways. And you see it in Virginia. Now, even if Republicans lose the state, it's still quite, tight and I thought that state was lost for good and I think the major issue down there is um, is education and uh, critical race theory and that's it's not as if uh, parents sit around saying you know are very specifically concerned with critical race theory but they get what that's all about in, in a broader sense it's not you know it's just this indoctrination that's been going on in schools so you see in Fairfax County in Virginia their uh, enrollment is, is down even though there's more people there than before so you see like Enrollment going down, you see more people open and polls at least to school choice. I think that that's going to manifest in, in policy changes at some point. I hope. Uh, I think school choice, just in general, is one of the, the issues that conservatives can win. I think par- I think parents, minority parents, um, all around the country are op- are more open to th- that idea than, uh, than than many professional pundits think. Something else that seems to me may be a, a binding moment that, that could have some lasting power in terms of changing culture or at least beginning to change mindset and changing culture. It's just the response to all the COVIDian mandates, uh, most notably the VAX mandate now. I mean, you have a lot of middle-income people from different walks of life, different professions, public sector unions, private sector, middle managers, black, white, Latino that are recoiling against these mandates, even if they, you know, understand the end game and they want people to 
you know, not get sick and they want to protect their children at school. But the way this is being done is roiling a lot of people. Right. Uh, initially, and we, we spoke about this quite often during the pandemic or the height of the pandemic, you know, you had a lot of um, mandates unilaterally without any debate, without any kind of legislation, just handed down by government. And people were quite willing to uh, to go along with it. I think that that changed after they realized that they had been lied to by some of our institutions, misled by the media sometimes, whatever it is. So I think there's a, quite a bit of pushback to that, and I'm happy about it. You know, there was that story where Ruth Marcus, who's a columnist at the Washington Post, was in the elevator with someone, and she said to him, you know, I think you should be wearing a mask. I don't know why you're not doing it. And he said, I don't care what you think. And she got very <laughs> mad and wrote a column about it. I think I don't care what you think is quite a, a, a nice American uh, slogan. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. uh, I think um, that we have to care less what our elites tell us to do because they failed us, quite frankly, in many, many ways. And, you know, I think that's good for us moving forward. I think less trust. I mean, in some ways it's destructive because we have no one to trust these days, frankly. But, you know, as far as our institutions go, not the media, not the government. But perhaps, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll have our communities acting on their own and not just blindly, you know, being a docile uh, population like they are in Europe quite often. Yeah, we start by knowing who not to trust, and then we continue <laughs> looking for people we can trust. That that makes sense right, to me. Right. David Harsani, senior writer for National Review, his new book, Out Today, so pick it up, Eurotrash, Why America Must Reject the Failed Ideas of a Dying Continent. David, thanks for joining us. Good luck with the book. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, and he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. You're listening to Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, 